You've abandoned ship and you're in your life raft. What happens next? We spoke to a friend of ours about what happens to you when you're in a life raft. So, Kev, tell us a bit about yourself, why we should listen to what you have to say. I'm presently working as a search and rescue helicopter pilot in Mackay in Queensland, Australia. And I used to work in the Royal Air Force as a flight lieutenant on the Sea King Rescue Force. And now I've been a search and rescue pilot uh, for about 25 years and uh, sailing for a lot longer than that. So I've always been thinking about life rafts. There's lots of information out there, but I think uh, sticking to the basics is the key because when it gets to a survival situation where the boat's going down, you need to get into the life raft, then the bare bones of information is what you're going to remember and the simplest actions are what's going to save you. We do uh, life rafts drills every year and that uh, teaches us a lot, uh, reminds us what we need to think about. Some of the comments that uh, you've seen there that other people have put in have been pretty good. Things like uh, survival suits, you never know how long you're going to be in a, a life raft for. Uh, that hypothermia issue is really going to take hold. Having your go bags prepped, that's really great as well. You don't have time in the worst cases to scrub around the boat trying to find stuff, so make it uh, easily accessible. That all starts off with either first that first mayday call, that DSC call, that's going to set the, the ball in motion. So people are going to start looking for you then. If you don't get the chance to do that, then you need to rely on an EPUB. Hopefully everyone carries one. They are invaluable uh, and they are gonna get you your most quickest, precise response. EPUB with GPS is probably the best solution in that it will then give the rescue coordination centers your fairly accurate position and it will get refined as the uh, uh, rescue progresses so that we have something to aim for straight away. We usually go off on very little information. Like we'll get told an EPIRB's pinging off north of a particular town or a coast station. Unless it has GPS, that's generally all we've got to go on. And those are usually picked up by aircraft flying nearby and in the normal run of the satellite, um, orbits, then they will pick them up. But that can uh, take some time to resolve and triangulate that position. Uh, so the EPIRB will get us going uh, and that'll be our main source of information when we get started. The EPIRB only really works its best ability if it's upright. And if we've got multiple EPIRBs going off, I, everyone's got one on the life jacket and the life raft and the yacht then that can confuse the issue as to what's actually going on. So once you get yourself stable in a suitable situation, I would recommend turning off all bar one of the beacons. That's going to clarify the situation for the rescue coordination centre. Uh, and if it's the vessel's EPIRB, then we know that it comes off a vessel, it's registered, um, possibly a little bit more information about what's going on. Things go wrong, EPIRBs fail, bits break off. You want to be prepared for uh, us locating you a little bit easier. The first thing that you need to be thinking about is your flares. Have your flares easy to hand, ready to use. If you've been in the water in cold conditions for any length of time, that's going to become more and more difficult. Although you do want to run the risk of uh, losing things if you get rolled over, try and keep your flares easy to hand because as soon as you see an aircraft, you want to be putting a flare up so that they can identify your position. You've always got the day-night devices. Uh, day smoke is fantastic. You can see that from miles away. It gives us indication of the wind. Parachute flares are great and obviously nighttime flares at night. You can see from a mile off. Other great location aids that uh, you may or may not have. During the day, a heliograph is fantastic. We can see a flash of a heliograph from miles away. At night, strobe lights, fantastic. They show up on night vision goggles really well. A sea marker die can be really useful as that spreads out. So if you've got a couple of sachets of that here in aircraft nearby, 
uh, then put that in the water that'll stick out uh, like a sore thumb as well hopefully you've got a handheld radio in the life raft with you and you've saved it obviously people will be tempted to put out uh, dozens of help calls not hearing anything back but if you save that for short range communications with a vessel that you can see or an aircraft you can see then that's going to help your situation. If we've got radio contact, then we can coordinate an awful lot better. Even if we can't see you and you've used all your flares and nothing else is working, if you can see us, then you can call us into your position uh, relative to the aircraft uh, and, and that'll help us find you. The first one, I'm sure everyone's aware, is stay with the vessel as long as you can. The vessel's a much nicer environment than a life raft. It'll also keep you more comfortable, safer, more protected. It's a bigger sight, uh, a bigger object for us to sight and to find. And uh, it's a, generally a better life-saving uh, environment. If you do need to abandon ship and get into that life raft, try and stay with the ship as long as you can. Again, it's a bigger target for us to find. The short-term priorities for survival are protection, location, water, then food. So everything you do from then on, you need to be thinking about protecting yourself as much as you can. And, and there's the obvious things from uh, taking seasickness pills before you start in there, keeping plenty of water for hydration, um, not worsening any injuries. Getting into a life raft with a broken arm or a busted wrist is nigh on impossible. So protect yourself as much as possible. Uh, once you get into the life raft, uh, again, still think about protecting yourselves. Life raft's probably gonna turn over several times in uh, big seas. So don't ditch your life jackets. Deflate them a little bit to assist you, but keep some air in there because chances are you'll probably end up in the water again. Uh, think about the other people around you, how can you protect them? Uh, think about hypothermia, think about sunstroke, heat exhaustion. Do everything you can to protect yourself in that life raft. Uh, then you need to think about location. Uh, and as I said before, EPIRB is your, your first line of defense after that Mayday call. Um, handheld radio, uh, flares, torches, strobes, heliograph, sea marker die, Anything you can do to aid your location. Don't use all your resources at once. Save them. Save them until you've got a reasonable prospect of rescue. Uh, there's no point uh, using everything up in the first three days and then no one's got anything to locate you with when the, the aircraft flies by you four days later. The, the, the main problem with uh, prolonged life raft inhabitation is giving yourself enough water. Uh, to keep yourself hydrated. Get a, a couple of jerry cans, not completely full, uh, and tie them to the side of your life raft. They are gonna help you. If you've got a life raft with a reverse osmosis pump, that's great. You can hand pump yourself some water as you go along. These few things are gonna keep you going in the first few days. Uh, hopefully your rescues come a little bit quicker than that, but you need to be thinking about this short-term survival. There's a few things that you can do to help us uh, as we're coming inbound. If you've got your radio, then you can give us a sit rep and the crews will probably ask for that. So we're looking to find out how many people are in the life raft, what their conditions are. This goes if you're on a, a, a vessel as well. We'll, we'll be much start to make plans straight away. So if we know how many people are there and who needs attention, what kind of medical attention they need, then we can start making a plan whether someone needs to be evacuated straight away or whether we stay and evacuate everybody. Uh, depending upon the situation, the range we're at, uh, how long it's taken to find you. We might be low on fuel, for instance, so only you can do the bare minimum. The more we know from your sit rep, uh, the more help we can give you. Now, once uh, the aircraft is fixed on your position and spotted it, you will know it. We're, we will orbit you a couple of times. If you're on a vessel, we'll be sort of assessing the situation of what we can do to help you. But generally, we'll, we'll come into a hover probably about 100 meters away from you to assess what's going on. We, we like a clean area to work with. So uh, we've got a winchman on the end of a, a wire and we don't want him to get entangled up. So if there are any ropes, um, 
uh, dangling in the water, uh, surrounding the, the dinghy life raft. Uh, try and get them all inside the life raft so that they are all contained. No one gets hurt by flying debris, ropes, uh, canisters that the, the life rafts came in. Um, anything you can do to clean up the situation will help us. The drogue that stops you drifting, if you can ensure that's deployed properly, that will stabilize the life raft in the downwash of a helicopter. It's all going to get pretty noisy, confusing, debilitating when that helicopter gets over the top of you. So anything you can do beforehand to make life easier for yourselves will ease the situation. Uh, one of the things we recommend is once you've got all the, the lines and that tidied out of the way is to collapse the roof and get on top of the roof. This is going to give the, the life raft less windage, uh, less effect by the helicopter downwash and it also makes it easier for the winchman to uh, board the life raft and then start uh, picking you off, getting you up into the helicopter. Sometimes he may even come in and cut the roof away. You're going to cry, obviously, because that's a nice shiny life raft, but uh, you won't be seeing that again anyway. And if you have uh, a leader amongst your group, if he can make contact with the winchman as soon as he gets down, he can then help prioritise who's going to come off the life raft. If there's no priority, then it will be whoever's closest and will start lifting them up to the, uh, the aircraft. It doesn't stop getting confusing until the doors are closed and everyone's flying off again. You'll be deposited unceremoniously in the back of the aircraft. If you're injured, you, you might well get a, uh, a life raft or a vest to lift you up in a, a more humane position. The rescue is uh, necessarily a little bit rough at times. You're in a hostile situation. Uh, and you need to get out of that quickly and safely, certainly for the crewman's health as well, so there won't be any time for niceties. Thanks for the information, Kev. I think we've all learned something from your advice there. But before we go, do you have a rescue story you could share with us? Uh, we'd heard during the night that a catamaran had actually pitch uh, and ended up upside down in the water. Uh, three persons on board, father, his friend and their daughter, and fortunately uh, they were in life raft. They were reasonably uh, lucky in that they were able to get out of the vessel at night into a life raft in reasonably big seas. Getting themselves safe and protected was their first bit of good news they did themselves, and getting a message out, uh, I think EPIRB was how they achieved that. We were sent off first light to, to go out there to get them. They were right on the edge of our range, so we refueled to maximum fuel at uh, Kangaroo Island, and uh, the winds were kind to us. We were able to get out to reach them, but we only had about uh, five minutes on of fuel on reaching them. So we had to do a pretty hurry up uh, kind of rescue there. And it was good that they were prepared. There was no injuries, which is great. So we were able to send our police officer, I think, police rescue officer down to uh, get the uh, casualties out of the life raft. He did that fairly swiftly. He, he knew the time pressures we were under for fuel. And all the time we're, we're assessing the situation, wondering if we'll have to land on the beach, uh, hoping the winds uh, will be more favorable to us going back and uh, maybe thinking about changes of height to maximise that. Fortunately, he was able to get the casualties up to the aircraft in very quick time, uh, and uh, we left the scene probably about a minute's fuel in hand. They had done everything they needed to do on the uh, life raft. They had prepared themselves, and they just had to wait. Fortunately, we could make it, and we got back to Kangaroo Island. Actually had enough fuel with a bit of a, a tailwind in the latter stages to make it back to the airfield and refuel. Three very, very grateful sailors.